So to kick off today, uh, I'd like to invite a longtime contractor in our area, Roger Blewett, to come up to lead us in our invocation. Uh, Roger, thank you. All righty, let us pray. Father, we just thank you today, Lord, for the opportunity and the privilege, Lord, to be alive. Hallelujah. In you, we do live and move and have our being. And we thank you today for bringing us together. How good it is for brethren to be together in unity, Lord. As one city, under one banner, Lord, we come with one goal in mind, Father. And we just pray today, Lord, that your will would be done in this meeting. That everything would be done with clarity, Lord, with purity of heart. Direct our hearts, O oh God. Whatever pretense or whatever presumptions we may have, open our minds and our ears to hear clearly today. And Father, we just pray that you would help us to grow as a community. Help us to grow to be a blessing, not just to this generation, but to the generation that is to come. Father, we thank you for the experience in our city, those that have paved the way, that has brought us through storms and troubles and situations and helped us to be a city that is better today than we were yesterday. And Father, we're asking right now that wisdom would cry out and that we would hear you in all things, that you might be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Roger. And if y'all would, uh, join me and stand. We'll say uh, the pledge to our nation's flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for once which stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You can be seated. Well, guys, as mentioned, welcome and thank you again for being here. Uh, my name is Bo Hansen. I'm the deputy building official for the city of Beaumont. Uh, and I've been, for, been with the city for just under a year, so not that long. Uh, but one of my primary focuses in assisting Mr. Meyer, who's going to introduce himself in just a moment, moment has been this code adoption process. Um, and so believe me when I say it's good to be here. It's good to be at this stage of the process. And I'm grateful for stakeholders like you for showing up and uh, who care so much about the development of Beaumont. Speaking of stakeholders, uh, this is a diverse group of folks. And so I'd like to take a minute to introduce the room a little bit, if we could. Um, who, who here, uh, I'm going to ask for a little bit of crowd participation with you guys, so bear with me. Uh, show of hands, who here is a general contractor? Any general contractors in the audience? Okay, we got a couple of you. Uh, who here represents our trades? Plumbers, electricians, mechanical? All right, good group of guys. All right, good. Uh, what about designers, engineers, architects? Great. Very diverse. Uh, also, just to recognize, where'd she go? Mayor Mouton. Thank you for being here, Mayor. Uh, we have Chief Earl White. Uh, we have uh, District Chief uh, Scott Wheat with us today. We have our inspectors here with us today. Uh, we also have uh, a couple of other special guests, ICC representatives, uh, Mark Roberts and Rich Anderson are here, as well as IATMO representatives. We have John Maida in the room. And so a lot of the codes we're gonna be talking about today, uh, we have ample representation on, and hopefully today is a fruitful conversation, one that we walk away with confident about how we move forward as a city in Beaumont. Uh, we also have quite a panel that's going to be chiming in periodically with me today, so you don't have to listen to me talk for uh, 30 minutes as a monologue. We're going to be interacting with one another, uh, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves to begin. Uh, Joe, you want to start us off? Uh, a lot of y'all know me, but I'm Joe Condina. I'm fire marshal for the city of Beaumont. I've been with the fire department for a little over 35 years. I've been fire marshal for going on eight years. Uh, I've actually uh, been in, held an inspector as far as fire inspector certification since 1995 and have instructed inspectors within our department uh, as far as, again, fire inspectors. Uh, as far as class-wise. So um, I was actually a fire marshal when we adopted the 2015 codes. Uh, so I have been through this process before and uh, looking forward to working through this next uh, phase of adoptions. Good afternoon. My name is Boyd Meyer. 
I'm the building official for the city of Beaumont. I've got about 11 years of experience in the construction industry. Uh, also a uh, city of Beaumont service in the building codes division, uh, 28 plus years. I uh, worked my way up from a uh, certified building inspector, plans examiner, uh, deputy building official, and I've been the building official uh, for the city going on nine years. Um, and I uh, have experience uh, in a lot of the codes uh, that some of them have been combined now, but all of the codes, uh, probably uh, three or four different states in the United States, uh, single family residential, multifamily, light commercial, heavy commercial. So I was in the definitely uh, a lot of uh, broad experience across the board as a contractor superintendent, project manager before I actually got with the city of Beaumont. So uh, I've been on both sides of the fence, so I, I look forward to the uh, discussion today to, to uh, move forward with uh, discussing the code adoption. Good afternoon. My name is Molly Villarreal. I'm the city engineer for the city of Beaumont. Um, prior to joining the city about 13 years ago, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I was a private consultant working at local engineering consulting firms for about 13 years. So for 13 years, I sat on that side of the table and then I came to the city and joined this side of the table. So I've had experience in navigating uh, the city's approval processes uh, from both sides and uh, here to do what I can to help with the city. Uh, got three years now experience with the city as a city engineer and prior to that, uh, water utilities. So thank you. Thank you guys again for being here. And also, I want to over communicate. Thank you to our inspectors. Our ins can you all raise y'all's hands, inspectors in the room? I don't know where y'all are. Y'all spread out all over the place. This has been a group effort. And I think more than anything, uh, that's what we want to communicate today is that uh, the amount of studying that has gone on with our inspectors, uh, multi departments that have gone into this. Uh, thank you guys for uh, Chris Boone, who's uh, here, but dealing with something. Um, thank you for all that y'all did. We really appreciate it. Um, moving on. So I, I want to begin here. This is one of my favorite quotes. Let me just, uh, it, was, it was actually said by a friend of mine. Let me read it for you. Beaumont does everything in their power to make people not want to build there. They fail you for a new, new amendment they dreamed up last night and get mad at you for not knowing about it. Um, I really like that quote because that's real. Um, that's how often contractors can feel working in Beaumont. Uh, whether it's how we enforce things or how we don't communicate things, um, it's real. And so, and just when you think we are clear, the next problem is consistency. So I can speak for all of us and say that we hear you. And for me, the new guy, um, it's been very encouraging to watch uh, these folks who have been here for years, uh, decades even, um, that work very hard and take it very seriously to have the, com the conversations that matter so that we can avoid quotes like this. Um, I know we've all heard quotes like this. So we hear you too, and we want you to know that we take it very seriously. And that's why this code adoption process matters, communicating with the stakeholders and making sure we get it right. Uh, so today is all about that. It's all about clarity in the code and uh, asking the questions. What are we gonna enforce? How did we get here? What is state law? These are all the right places to begin. Texas is, uh, in a lot of ways, a melting pot of codes. Uh, as it currently stands, uh, in both year and in publisher, the International Code Council provides the most material for the state, but as you can see, TDLR adopts the NEC as the chief authority for electrical, and plumbing and mechanical have two different code books formally adopted. And so the bottom line is local jurisdictions enforce this as a minimum, but we always strive to adopt newer, which I'm going to dive into in just a moment a little bit deeper. Today's goal is going to be threefold, and just to, we, want, we want to set this up front just to give you clear expectations of what you're in for. I was talking with some who are here representing a particularly homeowners association or whatever you represent. I know we have a diverse room. We're going to talk about, of course, the code adoption process, but our, our goal is, one, we want to provide clarity on this whole process, not just on where we've been, but more importantly, where we hope to go with uh, the experience here in Beaumont. And then, two, obviously, we will walk through the pr proposed codes, and in some ways, we're simply following the state's lead, as I just showed. 
but also we want to help you navigate well the permitting process entirely because 99% of the frustrations, like that quote earlier, are a result of simply not knowing what is expected of you. And so we want to make sure we share some of the significant changes we see, the items we propose amending by ordinance, and then also objective differences in two similar code books. Uh, Boyd, you've dealt a lot with our ordinances. Do you want to chime in on that? Sure. Uh, so when you're designing your project in Beaumont, and of course other cities, but mainly in Beaumont right now, uh, you go to our city website, and first thing you want to do, of course, is check what current codes we're on, and then uh, also the uh, code of ordinances or city ordinances that states on our website. Uh, if you go on there and go under business, uh, you'll find it, uh, building codes is under chapter 24. Uh, of course, fire is under chapter 8. But uh, under building codes, under chapter 24, uh, you'll find the uh, local amendments to everything dealing with building codes for the IBC, IRC for one and two family dwellings, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, uh, property maintenance code, uh, everything, so on and so forth. Everything's going to be listed in the code of ordinances, and uh, you will see the amendments in there to each code. So besides knowing the code, look in there and see what uh, amendments have been made to each code to make sure that if there's any changes that while you're designing your project that uh, you know exactly uh, what's required in Beaumont. And then third, third is uh, the last and most important goal. At the end of this time together, we want to hear from you. We'll ask for comments and questions, and we'd ask you to go ahead and be considering two things with us. Uh, we're not going to have a stopwatch on you, but please keep comments and questions under three minutes, uh, if you could, or less. And then two, please use the code books we provided. We provided a table here. I will give you my mic at that point, um, and you can ask a question where everyone can hear, and then we'll have a panel, which we're going to invite at that time, an ICC representative and an IATMO representative to help field these questions. So hopefully, again, the heart of today is to walk away with uh, a lot of technical conversation, a lot of good conversation to where you feel confident moving into this new, to, new code adoption process with us. Um, also, there's uh, pieces of paper and pens uh, where you can jot down notes throughout this uh, as we walk through each book. We want to encourage you to do that so you remember to ask that question. Uh, you can also submit them anonymously. If you want to uh, submit a comment, you can write it on a piece of paper and make sure Lindsay or Delancey, who are at the door, uh, get that piece of paper and we will uh, take your feedback into consideration. And then, of course, please help yourself to all the coffee and cookies and water that you can help yourself to. So I told you we're going to have crowd interaction, so I need a show of hands to help uh, think about a situation. Here's the situation. You have an existing home that has sustained minor smoke damage from a kitchen fire. While repairing it, you decide to demo a wall to achieve that open floor plan you've always wanted. What type of permit is needed? Show of hands, who here thinks this should be a repair permit? Nobody? What about an alteration permit? What about an alteration permit? We have one vote, two votes. What about a code compliance permit? All right, there's not much crowd participation here. So here, I'm going to need y'all's help. All right, so this is, uh, this is an alteration permit, but also, what about with the energy? Do you need a third-party energy inspector on this job? There's a, there's a little easier one, maybe. Who here says, yes, I need an energy inspector on this job? Who here says, no, you should never have an energy inspector ever on a job? Okay, good, just making sure. <laughs> All right, so uh, here's the reality and why I ask that question. It's less about which type of permit you need. Um, clarity is going to be the theme of today. Define lines. Uh, defining lines is a key item we've been working on as a team, starting with clarity on which permit covers what scope of work in black and white. There's no more guessing. We're really working hard to define those lines so that it's not our interpretation, it's the field knows exactly uh, what is expected of them. That's important for th a number of reasons. One, the cost uh, associated with that permit for you as a contractor. Um, each permit is uh, feed differently. And then two, consistency on what we require in the permitting process. And an example of this, we don't need a full set of plans for a repair permit. An alteration permit, we're going to ask for plans. We want to know that wall's disappearing. What's the new floor plan of the space going to look like? 
Um, so again, just so you know what's expected on the front end. And then third, consistent, consistency on how we enforce the energy code and other items, which covers the second item here on this slide. We've built a clean handout to make it incredibly easy to meet the energy code. From the moment you pull the permit, you should know is exactly what is expected on your job. That's our heart, is defining those clear lines for your sake and providing clarity. Going back to that quote we saw earlier, there's enormous frustration when we enforce something one way over here and then force it another way over there. So defining lines in black and white helps us solve this together. Windstorms, another difficult item that we are working uh, on building clear language around. Again, Boyd, you've had a lot of experience with enforcing windstorm in this area. You want to chime in here? Um, to be clear on something that um, there has been a lot of uh, confusion about is when we tell people that they need to have windstorm, we're working on more clarity for people because a lot of them think that, well, I don't need I don't need windstorm because I'm not going to get insurance on that building. Well, there's windstorm for the Texas Department of Insurance, and then there's windstorm for our codes, whether it be the IBC or whether it be for the uh, uh, the IRC and also our adopted ICC 600, which is a standard for uh, residential construction in high wind regions. So we're working on more clarity on that to make sure that in the future that people don't have the confusion saying that all I, you know, whether I need insurance or not, that that's a separate deal. But if you bill to our, our codes and standards, you're going to be able to get the insurance. But you do have to go through the process and get your windstorm certification, your inspections. But there, there's some confusion in there, and we're just going to try to clarify that for everybody. Thank you for that. And then one last thing here, uh, if you aren't aware, the city offers free pre-development meetings every Thursday, and shameless plug there for that. Um, if you have a commercial project coming up in the city of Beaumont, we want to make sure you know about these pre-development meetings. This may be one of my favorite things Beaumont does. Um, all the departments are in one room around one table, and you get all your questions asked at one time. And it is a beautiful thing. Hopefully, you walk out of that room knowing exactly what's expected of you before you begin your project and uh, encounter that problem in the field. We want to get ahead of problems with you. That's our biggest goal. Um, so if I can step on a soapbox on that for a moment, please get with us before your project begins. That's, that's the number one thing to avoid uh, quotes like we saw earlier. All right, moving on. The point of code adoption, and then we're going to get into the actual code books. Uh, we've already covered the bottom part of this illustration, but there is a tension between the bottom two that we want to cover. The state adoption as a minimum, uh, but also keeping up with the best insurance rates and FEMA disaster re uh, relief requirements. Um, Molly, you, as a city engineer, um, have dealt a lot with post-disaster -dis recovery. Uh, you want to chime in here? We have uh, been working with FEMA since Hurricane Harvey. So every Monday morning at 10 a.m., I'm on a, either in a meeting in person or on a call with our FEMA representatives uh, working on the public assistance program, which specifically is geared toward city-owned facilities that were damaged in Harvey. And this recovery process, of course, has been extensive and we're still not through it. So one of the, the things that are very important to them is what was the condition of the facility prior to the disaster that struck? When we've gone through this exercise, well, name your storm. We've gone through it with Imelda. We've gone through it with Marco. We've gone through it with Laura, Delta, Zeta. I'm sorry. Um, so what was the facility constructed to the codes that were in effect at that time? That's the first question that they always ask. Then they ask, you know, what were your what were your maintenance records to ensure that the facility continued to operate at those codes? And then when you rebuild, either to repair the damages or to mitigate the damages from that disaster, what are the current codes that are in effect? And is the proposed design and repair going to meet the current codes as they are adopted. So the codes are very important to us as we work through uh, disaster recovery with, uh, with FEMA and uh, the state. Thanks, Molly. And then, Joe, you see the safety side of things as uh, the fire marshal. You want to add on to that? 
I'd like to just throw out a couple things. On the safety side, uh, the importance of constantly, you know, reevaluating our codes and updating them, there's a couple different things we look at. First of all, there's an, a changing an environment in the, in the fire service. Uh, just as we've seen, you know, electric cars coming into uh, service and now people are putting charging banks and one thing or another in their homes. So, you know, now the code looks at that. We, uh, some of y'all are familiar with what they call ISO, which is Insurance Service Organization. That's what the cities are rated. Your insurance companies, a lot of them that are local, will know what your city is, like what Beaumont. We are a rated at a class two, which is good. It runs from one is the best up to a 10, uh, usually out in the rural areas where there are volunteers just because of not having the water supplies, not having uh, personnel that are available to come right away. Uh, their, their ratings go up, but again, for Beaumont, we're a two, which is very good. Um, that rating is evaluated every few years. The, uh, the, so when they're rating that, they look at what code adoption. That's one of the things they look at. And they want the codes to be current. So codes come out, what we look at, come out every three years. But the ISO says, okay, you can adopt every five years. You don't have to do every three years. So we try to stay on top of that. And then the codes, of course, they're trying to stay on top of the most current things that are going on with that uh, you know, as far as like safety. For us, again, it's the fire safety side is what we're looking at. So, uh, yes, it's very important for it to all stay on top of what's going on current. So that's, that's where the safety part comes Perfect. in to keep in adoptions. And, and that's, that's our focus. Uh, that's the tip of the spear. Uh, that's the point, is simply doing it the right way, which leads with safety, uh, leaning on the wisdom, especially in Beaumont, Texas, that we've learned from past hurricanes. Uh, and then also for you guys, leveling the pay playing field for contractors. When that hurricane comes and all these fly-by-night contractors come swarming in, we want to make sure that everyone, again, clarity and consistency, that we're enforcing it the same across the city so it's a fair ball game for everybody. Uh, clear code adoption matters deeply. Um, all right, another thing on clarity, uh, accessibility. Um, how many of you have experienced our city work system? Show of hands. A few of you. So it's our online uh, permitting portal. If you haven't done it, surely someone in your office has done it. Uh, so one more thing on clarity before diving into the codes. We can't provide clarity if you can't access the information. And CityWorks has allowed us to do that so much better um, in ways that uh, we never thought we could. Truly, the two work together. Uh, we know there's some kinks in it. We're working. Uh, regularly with IT to work through some of those things. But CityWorks allows us to give you access from any job or in your car, on your couch. Um, and, and we believe that's the most important thing. Also, how many of you know exactly how much your permit is going to be for every job? When you're doing that budget for that job, you know exactly what that permit fee is going to be. Anybody? Odds are you don't because some of you. Um, but most of the permit fees are pretty complicated. It's a, it's a complicated process. And so one of the items we're proposing is more flat fees so that you can build your budget better. We want to make it easy to understand, consistent. Uh, and I, I will say, we haven't raised our fees since 2010. Um, and I know we've all felt the impact of inflation. So while they will be a little bit higher, they will also be laid out in a much more under, understandable way. And you're going to have access to all of this on your website. So it's very clear, very easy to understand. Uh, Technology is allowing us to do uh, and think about things that we never thought were possible, never thought, uh, never we could imagine doing things like this. And so th things like virtual inspections are on the table. These are the type of conversations we're getting to have now because of CityWorks. Um, and other ways we can better serve you are being talked about regularly with multiple departments. Uh, Molly, I know engineering alone, uh, y'all have a couple of pretty cool things brewing. Thank you. So we're trying to work on improving our asset management, uh, but also, too, to work smarter, not harder. 
So to that end, we are ramping up our usage of GIS uh, so that we have a good and accurate inventory of what our infrastructure is. When you have 800 miles of sanitary sewer line, you know, it's, it's a lot to keep a track of. I think one visualization that was uh, given to me is, you know, take the sewer pipe that we have in Beaumont, start in Beaumont and lay it out all the way down I-10. How far do you go? Well, you end up in El Paso. So that's a lot of infrastructure hidden underground that we've got to keep up with. So we're capitalizing our uh, GIS to be able to have this information to us at our fingertips. Uh, another thing that we have worked with the Department of Defense and Lamar University to begin installing, we've installed some ditch monitoring uh, systems where we can uh, real time see the depth of flow in ditches, we can get images of the ditch to see what is happening. And so we've added those in some sensitive areas to monitor flooding during major rain events. We also have our Tempest weather systems. We've been, we're in the process of installing them at the fire stations, which are strategically located across the city, as well as at City Hall. And so now Weatherbug has picked up on these Tempest stations so that you can go on the Weatherbug app, which has improved in the last year, I will admit, and you can see what the actual weather conditions are real time at the individual locations. And so we're able to have that data at our fingertips. Uh, the new paving study that we are about to kick off is going to uh, give us an updated status of the road conditions in the city of Beaumont. And one of the new things that we're adding to assist us uh, is that we'll app using the same data that they capture for the conditions of the roads, they're also going to be able to inventory our sidewalks. And we have about 600 center line miles of road. So that way you have an updated, accurate picture, but now also add a sidewalk inventory on top of that, which will help us in our future planning on what we need to do to improve accessibility across the city. Um, and the newest thing that we have is Google Earth has, uh, we've purchased a camera compatible with Google Earth so that we're able to mount it to one of our city vehicles and update the street view. Uh, so I know a lot of our design professionals, you probably open Google Earth every day uh, looking for information that's available to you as you work through your design process. And so having that ac uh, updated street view, because a lot of the smaller roads in Beaumont, the imagery hasn't been updated since 2006 at best. So this gives us more accurate information. And all of this works towards ha letting our city staff give efficient, accurate answers to questions that contractors, developers, builders may have. And so that way we don't have to pause, go out in the field, take a look, measure, come back. If we don't have to, we have that information at our fingertips. You get the answers that you need and you're able to progress with your project. Thanks, Molly. All right, let's talk code, shall we? In addition to uh, what we're gonna be covering today, uh, this isn't the complete set that we're going to actually dive into detail with. Um, again, I just wanna point to this table right here. As you think about any questions you might have and you come up and you want to uh, maybe look something up in the code books, you're welcome to do that right there. But in addition to today's conversation, uh, we're proposing the adoption of the 2021 International Swimming Pool and Spa Code. Uh, the 2021 International Property Maintenance Code, the 2021 International Existing Building Code, and the 2020 ICC 600, which is what Boyd was talking about earlier, which is particularly relevant for us as a hurricane-prone high wind region. All right, so let's start with the 2021 IRC, um, the International Residential Code. Uh, and let's talk about coverage uh, for a moment and what that book entails. This book covers all one and two family dwellings with plumbing, mechanical, all included. The only deviation from this would be the references to the energy code and then also the national electric code. So again, the IRC is residential in almost its entirety. Uh, so I wanna make that clear. 
Uh, council recently brought us a, a very good point about what homeowners are allowed to work on if it's their homestead. Maybe some of you have experienced this frustration if you live in Beaumont. Um, and we, we agree, this is a good thing to think about. So another pr proposal we are making this cycle is a clause that defines just that in conjunction with the scope of work defined by permit. So to be absolutely clear, this, this does not mean your investment properties. Uh, if you own them and they're investment properties, they're not your homestead, that's not what we're talking about here. This is for homesteads only, but identifying what work you can do without a permit is something we wanna clear up this code cycle. Um, additionally, the IRC calls for a 10 mil vapor. This is one of the technical issues we saw. Um, it calls for a 10 mil vapor barrier for foundations where it was six mil. Uh, Boyd and I dug into this and uh, really see no valid reason from anyone uh, for this. So our proposal is to amend this and, and keep it six mil. So that's one of the things that you'll see a big change on in the IRC, but we're amending that or proposing to amend that to keep it six mil. Uh, but this would be a great, if you know something that we don't, this would be a great thing to jot down on your pad if you know something uh, and maybe you want to ask a question on that. Uh, and then the last notable item in the IRC is that the 2021 really stepped its game up in regards to uh, covering field innovation. You're going to find solar provisions, tiny homes, 3D printed homes, and even shipping container homes are listed in the 2021 IRC. Boy, that's another one that you've dealt a lot with in the office. You want to touch on that one? Uh, well, t on tiny homes, uh, you're really, uh, they're trying to make them as small as possible, so you really go to the minimum room sizes uh, in the IRC on tiny homes, and uh, to make sure the minimum room sizes, emergency egress, the uh, lights and ventilation and everything, it's really uh, basically just to make sure that there's the room and clearances, bathrooms, uh, everything, uh, uh, your your working space in the kitchen area, everything is uh, meets the minimum uh, uh, standards in the IRC. Now the um, shipping containers. Um, so there's a section added, section 3115. Uh, they call them intermodal shipping containers. Um, so when these most of these containers, when they're bought, they should have a data plate on it. And there's, they're getting to be more and more popular. Uh, people are, I mean, you see them all the time, mostly uh, 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 not as much in the Beaumont area, but it, they're getting more and more popular, whether it be for commercial or for residential use. Uh, once, these, once these containers are altered, then engineering uh, uh, is gonna have to be involved. They are engineered as they're built the, those data plates will have manufacturer name, there's an ID number on it, uh, safety approval numbers, uh, so even allowable stresses, whether it be vertical uh, loads or actual maximum load capacity, what they originally used for, of course, as a storage container. But once, that, uh, once it's modified, it'll have to be engineered, and then, uh, of course, that'll be, have to be submitted to the city uh, as part of the permitting process. If you want, let's say you want to pour a slab and use a perimeter of your house for storage containers and then attach, let's say, maybe manufactured roof trusses uh, somehow to the, the top of those containers, uh, all that will have to be engineered because it's beyond the original manufactured design of that storage container. So just if anybody approaches you, the design professionals or any individual would like to do that, just keep in mind that you will have to, to budget for an engineer that will have to be involved in the design process. Thanks. Next, we're uh, proposing the adoption of the 2021 International Building Code. And um, here's something I want to take advantage of this audience and discuss, and that's occupancies. Uh, how many of you own space that you might lease to a tenant or have dealt with that? Um, it, it's common for a lot of us, and so each occupancy has different provisions associated with it. And that's, that's one of the main problems we come across when uh, dealing with landlords is not realizing that there's different occupancies. It's not just residential provisions and commercial provisions. Each occupancy ha has its own set of provisions. Uh, when you switch op occupancies, we want to talk about that as well. Say you have a tax office renting from you and then you leave, they leave and you want uh, 
some sort of mom and pop retail shop to go in. That occupancy has changed from gener general business to mercantile. Now those occupancies are very similar, but that's an example of the type of occupancies that change. And the whole intent of the code is, have to, is going to have to be met when those occupancies change. Uh, we love the term uh, a building's grandfathered in, but again, that doesn't apply when an occupancy change. Please remember that, help us out with that. Uh, a lot of people are shocked when we tell them that. Um, the entire space has to be brought up to code. And again, if you have questions on that, that's another one. I want to encourage you, write questions down, get ready to uh, ask them at the end of this. Uh, you know, other than that, there's really not too much that's going to impact y'all's bottom line in, tw in the 2021 codes that we see. Uh, but one example we see is, is for automatic doors. Uh, and honestly, it's, it's not huge, but specific occupancies are now clarified on when they will require uh, power operated doors, specifically uh, the assemblies, they're getting a little bit smaller, so maybe uh, churches or other type of facility uh, buildings that are being built are going to be required to have automatic doors now. Uh, so just pay close attention to that. And then similar to the IRC, IBC addresses shipping containers as well as vehicle charging stations and even puzzle rooms are addressed. Um, and then one final comment on the IBC, out of all the books I have on my desk, uh, the IBC is the one we use the most because, again, it serves as the pivot point for all preceding conversations because of the importance of occupancies. Once we know what's going on in the building, we can then expand further by department. And Joe, I know this is something that the fire department works hand in hand with us on, especially on those pre-development meetings. You wanna chime in here? Thank you, Bo. Um, for us with fire codes, that is actually the first thing that we look at is the occupants classification. Um, in the front of our code book, uh, chapter two, it breaks down all the different types of occupancies and there's even subsections of those occupancies. Um, so if as he was mentioning about who maybe is the owner, uh, it's just as important for you as it is the tenant to, you know, reach out first to us because, and we get this, um, let's say there's a little uh, shopping center, a little strip center there, and uh, they've had some type of uh, uh, just a merchantile in there, some type of retail business. And they've decided to go in and say put in a, a a little restaurant. Well, there's a lot of parts of that that need to be looked at. First of all, the separation between those occupants and the other occupants that requires a two-hour rating on the walls. So you're going to have to beef that up. Additional cost, be it to the tenant or to the owner of the property. Now, again, depending on the square footage, it might include having to sprinkle that. Again, now that's a major cost. And this happens, we've had businesses come in and, and all of a sudden this guy's rented this place and he comes in and he says, I wanna put this, you know, this business in here, I've rented 4,000 square feet of this strip center and I'm gonna put a restaurant. And we say, okay, you're gonna have to sprinkle it and they go out and they get a bid and then it becomes unfeasible for them. So it's very important on the occupancy that we know what they're going to be. And we talk with y'all first. And that's again, one of these important deals about you can come to one of those Thursday meetings or you can reach out to us uh, and we can help you to get that answered before you ever get to that point. Uh, and again, this is something that happens quite often with billings that uh, people just don't realize that the importance of the occupancy changes everything. So everybody do me a favor, everybody raise your hand. Can everybody do that? Okay, everybody's hand works. Okay, we got another crowd participation thing. All right, here we go. Here's the situation, and I know your hands work, so no excuse now. I'm, a build, I'm building a 5,001 square foot commercial accessory building for storage. The building is unconditioned and utilized for the storage of beverages up to and including 16% alcohol. Here's the question, do I need to hire a third party energy inspector in Beaumont? Who says yes? Who says no? 
Again, do y'all's hands work? Come on. <laughs> they are hard questions. And, and that's kind of the point. Uh, the answer is it's an unconditioned space, so in Beaumont, we're not enforcing the energy code on that. Um, but that leads us into the conversation about the 2021 International Energy Con Conservation Code. Uh, it can be a complicated animal, and as mentioned, Though we are actively working with our approved energy inspectors to make this easier on you guys, clear, defined lines, that's important to us. We know it can be complicated. Uh, we want to make it easier on you guys. So the energy certificate is something that uh, I actually have personally. Um, it was what I was doing before I came to the city, and it's something that I, um, I care deeply about. And so for us, we want to harp on meeting the intent of the code. Uh, there are a lot of situations where there's really no point in hiring an energy inspector, um, whatever the case may be. So we're trying to identify those specific situations uh, and working with our approved third-party energy inspectors to have a collective uh, agreement on when we can do that. And then furthermore, communicate that to you guys because y'all are out bidding these jobs. We want you to know on the front end, is this going to be kicked in on this job? Because that's an expense that you're, you're going to want to know about. Um, I think... We're all going to admit, as city inspectors, uh, they might be shaking their head at me, but one of the areas we have been inconsistent on is required R values for ducks. Uh, the good news is that 2021 clears up a lot of that confusion in its entirety in the energy code. Uh, we've, we've admittedly gone back and forth on, on that, whether it be in conditioned space or outside or whatever it may be. We've gone a little bit back and forth, but we have clarity, clarity moving forward, and we are excited about that. Uh, and then also, here's a big one, uh, attic insulation. The 2021 IECC calls for R49 in climate zone 2, which is us, if you didn't know. Uh, and we're going to be proposing that we stick with R38 in the attic. Uh, we think that's in incredibly sufficient for this area, uh, and R49 is really an unnecessary expense. Uh, but even further than that, and, and for the plumbers in the room, I, I hope this is good news for you. Uh, we're going to propose that if your attic piping is buried in attic insulation, you're achieving the intent of the code. So here's the basic principle. If you crawl up in the attic and you see the actual PEX pipe, it's wrong. It should be buried in insulation. Uh, and if it's not, if it's coming out to your water heater or whatever it is, if it's exposed, it's wrong. If you see it, it's wrong. Is that simple enough? Again, we're trying to make these clear lines in the sand to where we can meet the intent of the code uh, in a simple way. And then lastly, I know many people who have gotten to the end of their job, this might be some of you in this room, and you throw your hands up with us saying, man, you never told me I needed an energy inspector on this job. And so one of the ways uh, we think we solve this is requiring that the third-party energy inspectors provide, or at a minimum, sign off on your res check or com check. Um, if you prefer that your engineer uh, does that for you or your architect does that for you, we're fine with that but your energy inspector still has to sign off on it because that guarantees from our point of view that they're working with you before you get your permit. They're telling you everything that you need to know. You've already worked that fee into your price. You're not gonna get mad at us at the end of the job. It's all laid out on the front of your job. So again, we're trying to think of uh, proper procedures to help you down the road because we understand the frustrations are real. Uh, next code we're going to talk about is the 2021 International Fire Code, and I'm way out of my league here, so I'm just going to hand, hand it over to Joe Condina. Right. I want to hit a couple of changes that we're looking at. Uh, of course, code uh, for the fire service is really about life safety. That That's that's our whole goal in, in the, the IFC part of the codes. And with, uh, with the new codes that we're looking at, a lot of this is dictated, as it has been for years, by events uh, that have, and, and some of this I mentioned about a while ago about like electric cars and battery backups at homes and stuff like that but a lot of it has been dictated by tragedies of you know building fires and one thing another so as as we move into the the new uh codes uh we'll actually you know we'll be looking at these these new things that are coming along and i'm going to discuss a couple things here but with today's I guess uh, with the the modern age that data is shared so much faster, I can remember, and again, 
I, I mentioned earlier, I've been with the department 35 years. I can remember when we used to wait from uh, National Fire uh, Academy would or you know would put out these uh, data, and it might be two years before we'd ever hear how many fire deaths were happened. You know, two years ago. Uh, nowadays, you know that this stuff is collected. Uh, these changes can be made. You know, on the next cycle of uh, code changes, because this is so much more current. And that's very important. And again, again, it's all back to life safety. Uh, water supply as uh, is is some changes for this uh, in this code. Uh, garage parking, like for the high-rise garage parking, some of the places here in town, the hospitals and stuff have them. Uh, they're getting a little stricter on some of that. Uh, we don't have any here in Beaumont right now, but you know some places will have garage parking with uh, a living above them, apartments, townhouses, and that type of stuff. That's all getting a lot stricter because again, we're looking at the cars being uh, electric, you get runaway uh, situations with the thermal runaway, which again is now addressed in the code books now. Uh, the, the battery banks uh, being uh, being a problem, you know, some type of short water damage to them a lot of times can cause this to happen with the uh, them starting to run away. They're, uh, you know, an issue for the fire service in multiple ways. Uh, they're they're not easily extinguished. They tend to uh, actually, uh, much like magnesium used to be for us with a lot of uh, like Volkswagen engines and stuff. The ox the water is uh, is actually it takes the oxygen from the water and it actually accelerates the fire. So it's a it's a situation of having to really flood those fires. Um, so again, uh, you know this thermal runaway. It's 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 all just kind of a combination of uh, that. Again, the code as these things are evolving into our everyday life, the code is working to keep up with that and that's all part of the you know again the life safety side of it all and the other thing is about like uh you know we we talk about these changes uh some things like like building codes was just discussing they've talked about some of the things they didn't feel like maybe we needed for this area well we're we're kind of the same. Uh, there's there's some uh, parts of the code that we feel like are for our area are maybe excessive, and uh, so we're going to be as part of our again adoption of the codes will be uh, basically not adopting or amending that part of it, uh, and this will include stuff like some of the older buildings having it you know having to go in and sprinkle it even if it's vacant now the new code says it's you're going to sprinkle these buildings within five years it's a time frame but if it's sitting vacant there's not a real purpose for that you know we feel like if you're going to come in and you're going to convert it and you want to make them into apartments or something okay because residential is going to require that but just to be sitting there so we're not going to adopt those parts and there's going to be a couple things like that so anyway there, there is going to be some changes and a lot of this is new stuff and the code stays on top of it because again i feel like with the modern day uh, able to share information they can keep on top of what our world is becoming so I just want to share a little bit of that. Thanks, Joe. Uh, next, we're going to look at the 2020 National Electric Code. Um, as mentioned, Texas Department, uh, Department of Licensing and Regulations does a great job of adopting the newest National Electric Code. Um, it's also the only trade that isn't covered by the ICC in a separate book. Um, one of the items we're going to propose is an automatic adoption in step with TDLR. Um, again, we're proposing this, uh, it's not for sure, um, but in, in September of this very year, they have already stated, they being TDLR, um, that they will be adopting the 2023 
NEC. So for your electricians on your job, they're going to be in September required by state law to follow the 2023 NEC. And this is unlike any other code book because again, electricians are required to follow this as a state minimum, so they're trying to keep, keep up with TDLR's quick adoption process. And so what we will likely do if that passes is have a clear communication plan with all who would be impacted months prior, identifying significant, significant changes to be mindful of. Uh, I don't know if we'll do a, a formal event like this or if we'll just do that by email, but just know that if you're concerned about that, we will be communicating months in advance of significant changes. Um, one of the big changes we see in the 2020 going from the 2014 is uh, just required GFCIs in general. If you're a home builder, uh, pay, pay close, close attention to this. Uh, that's one of the key differences in jumping from the 2014 to the 2020. Specifically, all 125 volt to 250 volt receptacles installed shall have GFCI protection. Uh, and there's been a lot of issues with that one, specifically around AC units not allowing it. Um, they're tripping the, the breaker, and so we're going to be amending that record, uh, accordingly. We've been working uh, with Sadie, our chief electrical inspector, and having lots of conversations about the practicality of that. And so just know that as these things come out and we see a problem with it in the field, we're hearing it, we're responding accordingly, and we want to keep in step with you guys. Um, also, surge protection. This is a big one that we see um, required on all residences. Uh, in the 2020. This is a big change, uh, but we believe it's a good thing, and from what we understand, it's really a very little cost. Um, I don't know the exact number, but it, it's, it seems to be very little for a, the uh, protection it gives an entire residence. And then lastly, emergency disconnects. Uh, Boyd, there's a big change for residences, uh, but also, Joe, I mean, this is old hat for commercial jobs, so y'all want to talk about that real quick? Okay, single family residential or one and two family dwellings actually, um, there's a new requirement coming up in the new code for disconnects for residential, one and two family dwellings. So this wouldn't be something that would be enforced on existing structures, but if there is a major uh, remodel, renovations, alterations to where we have services that are uh, upgrade new services and extensive electrical work. Uh, we will make a determination on existing structures, but on all new construction, there will have to be a, disc a means of disconnect on the outside of the building for emergency personnel, uh, for whether it be fire, EMS, whatever, whatever it might be on the outside of the building. We do have some structures in Beaumont, uh, residential structures to where we will find the, old, the panel is inside to where it's not accessible. So those areas will be required to uh, have a disconnect once, uh, whether it's new construction, it'll be mandatory to meet code, or if there's enough work to where we make a determination to where it needs to be upgraded and that needs to meet code, then we will require it uh, upon permitting. And then I'll let uh, Joe talk about commercial for a minute. So not a lot of change on the commercial side. Commercial has... Uh, been that way for years. It was adopted into the ordinance uh, some time ago. Uh, that was basically uh, a couple different reasons. Uh, a lot of the businesses uh, were uh, involved uh, a higher voltage. A lot of were three phase. Uh, here they're uh, bigger uh, structures you were committing firefighters to going into an area. Uh, so it was decided it, at some point, uh, probably I think it was two fire marshals back that they would uh, go in and, and have this added at, you know, for new buildings. Uh, or again, extensive remodeling with a lot of electrical work. Uh, so they did change that uh, and Again, it's 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 a it's a life safety, but it's directed for the firefighters. They're not, you know. Again, when I hired on, we used to pull meters ourselves, uh, like the residential meters. Uh, most commercial, when they're bigger buildings, do not have meters like that. Uh, it wasn't a thing we could pull. Entergy has to come out. They try to give us priority, but there's always some delays. Uh, you know, and so this was just a way for us to, again,
could start an interior attack and keep our guys safe. So again, not a lot of change, but that's the reason we've been doing it, and I, th I think it's going to be a good deal for the house as you know, residential as well. Thanks, guys. All right, let's talk <clears throat> plumbing and mechanical now. Excuse me. So our plumbing and mechanical codes are a bit different. As mentioned, these are the only areas where the state of Texas has formally adopted two different codes. Um, and we've spent the last few months both studying and listening to both sides present really compelling arguments and, and thinking through um, all of the intricate details of the codes. But our hope today is to lay out a few objective differences that we see uh, and then spend some time fielding questions and listening to you, of course. Uh, but before getting into the differences, though, I, I'd like to identify two very important things. And please hear me. Um, both are quality codes. Um, let me say that again. Both are quality codes, and there are hundreds of tiny differences within them that we cannot possibly cover in this environment. Um, but we're going to highlight, again, just some practical situations that we see how the two codes could be um, played out. And then also, to point to the obvious, anything can be amended locally by ordinance. As Boyd described earlier, um, we know that. We can um, amend anything locally. However, what we, uh, to give a fair side-by-side -side, uh, for today, uh, we're just going to simply present it as is and leave how we would need to amend it out of it. Fair enough? So let's talk about plumbing first. Uh, and I've broken this down categorically. Uh, for plumbing, we've, we're going to look at a supply uh, situation, a drain waste and vent example, and then fixtures. And then for mechanical, we'll talk about, uh, I'll give a duct example, exhaust, and then uh, change of occupancy and how that could be affected. So starting with supply, um, backflow preventers. The UPC calls for any backflow preventer installed in a location exceeding five foot um, a deck shall be built for servicing. IPC simply requires access and doesn't require a deck. So here's the reality of that enforced. Say you have one of these wall mounted in a commercial restaurant just over five foot. I saw one just the other day in a room crowded with other equipment. The device is accessible, um, but building a deck is not only costly, but wildly impractical in those tight rooms uh, that are already filled with other equipment. Again, that's something we could amend, absolutely, there's no doubt. Um, but just reading it as is, that's the type of situations that we need to look at and think through. Uh, a drain waste and vent example. Minor items like shower drains require larger piping in the UPC, I believe it's two inch to the shower. Uh, but maybe the most impactful item in Beaumont with our existing infrastructure is the slope required in the UPC. IPC generally allows a flatter slope, eight, uh, eighth of an inch and even sixteenth of an inch in some cases, depending on the size of your pipe. Um, which helps tie into existing sewer systems. UPC requires a quarter inch across the board, which will be difficult in many areas across the city. So, of course, good fall is always a good thing. Uh, and if we have the opportunity to adopt the UPC, we have no concern that the quality of work will continue. But these, again, are some of the issues we want to identify and think about with our local infrastructure. Lastly, fixtures. In most occupancy, IPC requires fewer fixtures based on occupancy loading. The exception is typically the larger facilities, uh, such as arenas or sporting facilities where actually the UPC requires less. Uh, we've talked a lot about these Thursday pre-development meetings, and we meet with entrepreneurs in these meetings every week and who are trying to open that new small business, and that, that is who I think about when we talk about this situation right here. More fixtures may be nice as a customer, absolutely. I think we'd all agree on that. But it can be a deal breaker. We see it every Thursday for that new local business trying to open up their first space in an existing building. In fact, uh, a prime example of that is uh, one we're working with right now. There's a new business owner. She just got her special use permit approved this past Monday for a business she wants to open on Calder. And because of the occupancy of that building changing, the whole building, remember, has to be uh, brought up to code. One of the things she is having to add is water and sewer to that building. The building has no restrooms, and she needs one. If we were to ap apply the fixture table in the UP in UPC instead of the IPC, this new business would need an additional bathroom. Um, these are some of the practical situations, again, we'd ask you to consider. Whichever code book you prefer, please think about these practical playouts for the community. Uh, and then let's talk mechanical real quick. Uh, ducts. 
the IMC separates out flexible air ducts and flexible air connectors. It states that flexible air ducts shall not be limited in length, and the connector shall be limited to 14 foot. UMC groups the two together and limits it all to a five foot total. This is a great example of the two codes. By installing the requirements of the uniform code, nine times out of 10, you will meet the intent of the international code. But generally, that means it's going to restrict you more. Um, typically, that means cost too. Uh, exhaust, similar. Dryer length limitation is a pretty similar and substantial difference as well. IMC allows for 35 foot total on that dryer exhaust, uh, and UMC allows for 14 foot total. So more than double the allowance by the ICC. We've had a couple of situations specifically with apartments going on right now and navigating around engineered trusses. It's pretty difficult to make 35 foot in some of these uh, environments. 14 foot would need to be well engineered on the front end. And then again, going back to that change of occupancy, occupancy I'll give the same example I used for the plumbing scenario. Uh, the same new business owner wanting to open up that manufacturing space right here on Calder not only would she need an extra bathroom, but the entire building would be required to have mechanical ventilation under the UMC, whereas the IMC, she would be just fine with natural ventilation. Um, so that's another expense passed on to these business owners who are trying to open up a new business, probably for the first time. So again, it's the business owners who are going to be impacted the most here. Uh, Joe, and I know fire stop protection is, is a big part of this conversation too. So. So when you're, of course, having to penetrate, you know, those space, uh, the, the firewalls, the fire barriers, you're going to have to do fire stops, uh, you know, be it uh, caulk, be it, uh, you know. So again, there, the more you're having to, to put in as far as, you know, like duck or whatever, that's going to, of course, add to right. the, that. It all works together. Yes, absolutely. And so lastly, as we conclude, uh, we've been harping on clarity. Um, clarity is consistency. So as we wrap up today, one final note on that. Uh, you know, there was a time where there was very much so regional codes. Um, IATMO, which was a product of uh, at the time, or maybe still is, I'm not sure, International Conference of Building Officials in the West, and then the SBCCI, which is the Southern Building Code Congress International in the Southeast, and BOCA, which is Building Official Code Administration in the Midwest, North, uh, Midwest to Northeast. In the 1970s, the American Institute of Architects and the industry as a whole proposed a singular code. And in 1994, that actually came to fruition when BOCA, ICBO, and SBCCI merged into what we now know as the International Code Council. Um, 2003 was Beaumont's first adoption of those I codes, and that's really been our heart ever since. I know I'm the new guy, but that's what I've been uh, taught, and that's what we're going to keep striving for, is how can we provide the most consistency and clarity in the city of Beaumont? Uh, Boyd, you've worked all over the country and you've run into this a, a couple of different places. You want to talk about that real quick? Thanks, Bo. Uh, first of all, uh, who all in here actually has a code book of some sort or another? Good, good. That's good to see. Um, straight out of college, I had a, back in, I'd say, 1982, I had a code book. Got certified as a building inspector straight out of college. And I was you after that. I was used to having a code book. Every job that I was on, whether I went to stayed in Texas, or went to Nashville, Tennessee, up in you know Connecticut, um, and there were different codes uh, throughout the United States back then. So uh, I knew because of college and uh, just being in the construction industry at such a young age, I just I always had me a code book. Wherever I went, I got a different code book, and I had to learn the differences learn the ordinances, and uh, always try to stay on top of things. You know, go over the plans and then get with the local jurisdictions. And so, um, so as these groups got together, whether it be the, uh, the ICC when they went together, but before that, it was still whatever that, whatever that jurisdiction had, I had to make adjustments. 
and it wasn't like amendments. It was just making adjustment because it was a different code. So, um, so I encourage you to uh, to get involved in in actually getting a code book and uh, seeing actually what we deal with here. Look at the table and see and uh, the 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 codes. My first code book. It was, it was very tiny. It was a little code book back in the 80s uh, that, that I carried around with me. And you look now what it's expanded to, of course. And, and, but at the same time, technology has gotten better. Things have gotten more efficient. There's a lot of things that actually, as things get better, the, the, we've gotten more lenient on firewalls. We've gotten more lenient on fire separations. The technology has increased to where there's a lot of things that are actually, when you sprinkler a building, like when, when the, the mall was built, uh, uh, there was uh, required tenant separation, fire separation walls through every one of them. Now with a fully sprinklered building, the business and mercantiles in between them, if it's a sprinklered building, it doesn't have to be rated. And it used to have to be. So as technology gets better, there's actually a lot of trade-offs in the code. You can take a big building and you can divide it up with fire barriers and not have to sprinkler it. And years ago, you couldn't do that. And so as things get better, there's actually things, as we adopt new codes, there's actually trade-offs to where we have these pre-development meetings. We can actually say, hey, you know what? There's really a way you could do this, and you wouldn't have to sprinkler the building. So we make those suggestions, and we try to help you to where maybe you can save some money. Maybe you have a different way you can do it. We make suggestions because we've done this so much over and over and over again. Maybe we can help. So we encourage you to get with the, us, get with your design professional if you're required to have one, and, and, and we will definitely try to help make it happen, if, if possible. Uh, sometimes we may have to dig in the code book for a little bit and get back with you. You know, some of them are pretty tough, you know, but we can usually we can figure it out. But uh, again, I just want to encourage you and, uh, on this, and again, I appreciate everybody coming here and appreciate uh, uh, what everybody's done to put this together. But... Uh, uh, anyways, that's, uh, that's pretty much what I have to say. Thank Thanks, you. boy. Um, and again, just to reiterate and kind of wrap things up here, consistency is the goal, and the development of the ICC solved a lot of that in many ways, and we believe that is the key to continue to benefit us locally uh, as we face natural disasters alongside workers from all kinds of different places. We believe these codes work integrally together, and while we can make more amendments, the reality is that consistency is the best way we can serve you guys. Uh, so whatever codes we adopt, uh, we're, we're proposing uh, a lot here today, and we want to hear from you. Whatever uh, works out, just know that our heartbeat, our hope is uh, humbly our recommendation is consistency and clarity. That's what we want to see in Beaumont and what we're going to push for because the people who are going to ultimately pay the price when we get that wrong is the small business owners and the contractors. And so that, uh, that's what matters most to us. So as we, uh, we hope this has been helpful for you. And again, I just want to thank you again for being here and being a part of this presentation and uh, what is now going to be a conversation, hopefully. Uh, any closing comments from the panel? Y'all good? Well, thank you guys again for being here. Thank you for our inspectors.